in three, two. Hello, everyone. This is Christy with Cover Health USA, and I am so excited about today's presenter, my good friend, Dr. Alan Sokoloff, and he's here to talk about um, one of my favorite aspects of chiropractic, and that's sports chiropractic, um, because two of my, my three are in sports, and if the 13-month-old is giving me Indian any indication she's going to be like a professional wrestler. So we're definitely going to need more sports chiropractors, um, at least in our neck of the woods. Uh, for those of you who do not know Dr. Sokoloff, what can I say about him? Um, highly entertaining speaker. You will never laugh and learn so much like you will when you have the opportunity to hear him live and in person. If I've got any Florida people out there, anybody going to be at the FCA National coming up in, I think, 24, 23 days? Go to his classes. He's speaking multiple times throughout the weekend. Stop by our booth. Get to talking to him because absolutely amazing and entertaining. So it's like a two for one, like you really so impactful. Um, super motivational, super inspirational, and hands down one of the nicest people you will ever meet. He's Aww. been in practice for over <laughs> um, he's been in practice for over thirty years. Uh he Again, has a huge passion for sports chiropractic um, from working with, you know, student athletes, high school athletes, um, parent education about what parents need to know to help keep their kids protected when they're playing sports. Um, college, and obviously, for those of you who are professional football fans, um, he works with the Baltimore Ravens and has been working with them for 20 years, I believe. So anyway, I'm going to quit that. going on and on. Because <laughs> I could talk about him all day. Dr. Sokolov, welcome to the webinar series. Thank you so much for having me, Christy. I am truly excited about today and uh, hopefully sharing some information. You know, all, all those things that, that Christy read, and uh, by the way, thank you again for for inflating my ego. Uh, but all the things that, that she's read and talked about, all that does is just allow me to share information that maybe you don't ordinarily get or have a hard time getting. Um, there are a lot of really, really talented chiropractors. And, you know, somebody asked me, this is my um, 19th year going on 20 with the Ravens. How do you keep a job like that? I've been with the University of Maryland sports medicine team since 1991. How do you do that? Uh, some of those answers are going to be included here. But what I explained to them is there are many times that, you know, in, in my area, in my county, I am sure there are half of the, the chiropractors that are out there are probably better adjusters, maybe more talented in different soft tissue techniques, but many of them have a hard time communicating. And a lot of them will say the wrong things. What, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to cover some of those today, and I'm going to talk about why I don't think there is a better time than now to be a sports chiropractor, or any type of chiropractor for that matter. And I will re-emphasize what Christy said. I, I love doing webinars because I get to reach many, many more people, but there is no more fun than doing it live. So if you get a chance to come out to uh, the FCA National down in Orlando, it would be great to see you there or keep your eye on the Cairo Health USA website um, for any upcoming uh, live, up-close, impersonal events. And I love to answer questions because we are all different. Our practices are different. Our techniques are different. And if you can learn one thing, one thing today that will help your practice as soon as you hang up the phone or turn off your computer then it was well worth your time. And I'd love your feedback as to what you learned and what you did with it. So what you say can hurt you. It's kind of a really neat topic. And as I mentioned, there is no better time than now to be a sports chiropractor. And, and here's, here's just a couple of the reasons. This is 
a couple of years old, but so very, very true, that kids are quitting sports by the by huge numbers more than ever before. Um, <clears throat> the main reason comes up in injury. They quit because they're hurt. You and I, in the positions that we're in, we have a great ability to affect the livelihood and the health of these kids when it starts young. If we could do more to help that, it's going to make their lives better. If we could do more to help increase that number in your communities, think about, you know, everybody thinks, well, it's really cool you're working with these pro teams, but the bottom line is most of our patients don't come from professional athletes. They come from treating the kids and the weekend warriors that play in county and rec leagues. So if we can increase the number of people participating, that's just going to give us more access to people. Speaking of people, one of my favorite peoples in the whole wide world is Dr. Jay Greenstein, and he talks a lot about the opioid epidemic. I cannot tell you that there is no better time to be a sports chiropractor than now because it is truly an epidemic, and if we could put ourselves out there as not just an alternative, but a true option, we're going to be in a much better place. I know there are any number of studies talking about how many kids are taking prescription opioids, but we're not here to talk about that. I would strongly advise if you get a chance to listen to Dr. Greenstein, he is the bomb when it comes to this. And I integrate a lot of what he teaches in with what I do in treating my day-to-day -day patients as well as athletes. But one of, the, one of the biggest problems we're facing now in our profession is kind of like the game of telephone. You remember when you, know, you would tell somebody something and then they would tell somebody something and it would go all the way down the line until the very end and you're like, what? Our profession has a hard time with communication, with what we hear and what we say. So hopefully today... Over the next three and a half hours, we'll cover the different – we're not really going three and a half hours. But um, we are going to cover things that you can say and some things that maybe you should not say. <clears throat> One of my favorite references is The Wizard of Oz, and to me it's kind of like chiropractic, and I, I, I use this a lot when I speak, in that – when you're covering sports and when you're working with athletes and you are not in Kansas anymore, you have to learn the language. You have to learn the customs. You have to learn the tradition of where you're treating. Um, and there is a huge difference between <clears throat> what you do in your office and what you do in a training room or what you do on a field. And if you understand what the differences are and know what things should be the same, that can help assure your success. And look, as I mentioned earlier, you guys have great knowledge of what you do technique-wise. You've gone through all the training. Some of you have had very individualized experiences that help you be better at what you are. And our skill set here is all very different. So I don't know if many of you guys remember, one of my favorite people in the whole wide world is Tim the Toolman Taylor. And Tim had a team of people around him, and everybody kind of understood their role. But I'm going to break down Tim the Toolman Taylor just a little bit more. Because when you go to chiropractic school, you're given an empty tool belt. And then it's up to you to pick and choose what tools you want to put in it. Do you want to put in a certain adjusting technique? Do you want to put in a certain taping technique? A soft tissue technique? Whatever it is, you slowly fill up this tool belt, then you put this tool belt on, 
put on your shirt and tie, or I like to practice in a golf shirt or T-shirt, and then you're, you're out into the real world. And then if you have somebody that comes in with a nail, you pull out your hammer. If you have someone that comes in with a Phillips head screwdriver and you happen to have one, you can help. But what if someone has something you can't help with? And we'll talk more about that later as well. So let's talk about <clears throat> some of the great things that chiropractors do that we get in our tool belt. Number one is consultation and exam procedures. We are the bomb. Chiropractors always have done a good job in discussing mechanism of injury. How did something happen? And in the sports world, this is real important. We have a great, great, great attribute in doing examinations. Now, I know most of you, if you've been practicing for a while, you're not doing the 45-minute or hour exam that we used to do. When we're in school, you've kind of fine-tuned it, but yet you always hear about people going to other practitioners and say, wow, that was a great exam, doc, but my other doctor didn't even do half of that stuff. That's because we're the bomb at that, and that's what we put in our tool belt. Extremity adjusting, something else that you can add to your tool belt while you're in school or after school, there are so many great extremity adjusting doctors teaching out there. I encourage you to take a class or two or three. Taping skills. You know, um, there are all types of taping skills out there. There are different uh, brands, different varieties, and there are different instructors that support each aspect of these different taping jobs. There are a lot of philosophies to them too. So this is another tool you can add to your belt to help you as a sports chiropractor or even just in your office. Soft tissue skills. Um, there are many that require extensive training. There are some that require less training. And many of you have probably adapted your own techniques over time. But having a soft tissue skill and working in the sports world is very, very, very important and something that should be practiced by everyone. So that's just another notch in your belt. Instrument-assisted skills. I do a lot with uh, Graston technique. I was uh, certified way back. Um, at the Baltimore Ravens, they have a set of hawk grip tools. Um, at College Park, they have sound-assisted soft tissue mobilization tools. But learning the principles and the whys and what fors and the technique can be very helpful. I strongly encourage this, and I strongly discourage just picking up something or an instrument without training. You may get the basic ideas, but there's so much more you can learn to further your skills and increase the number of tools in your tool belt. Dry needling. This is something that in the state of Maryland we're allowed to do, and I didn't start doing this until my wife had a chronic neck issue now, I did not say she's a pain in the neck. She, she had a chronic neck issue, and I was doing everything in my tool belt that I could. And I realized, you know what? There's something I don't have in my tool belt. Let's try that. So one of the other practitioners in my office dry needled her one time. Bada bing, it's done, and she is good. You know, now the things that I do have become more effective. So I figure, hey, Alan, you better learn to do what you need to do. And I took a dry needling course that was fabulous, uh, got a great education, and it is something that is new to my tool belt. So your tool belt isn't all about school. It's what you do after school. Um, rehabilitation techniques. We're fortunate enough to use a lot of different things in our office to help people help themselves. That is a tool that every doctor of chiropractic should have. It's not 
getting better means coming to my office three days a week until your insurance runs out or or until you, right? It's not about that. It's about what's best for the patient. What can the patient do to help themselves when they're not there? And that's what we try to teach as well. So rehabilitation is real big too. We use uh, recently another addition to our tool belt is using a laser. And the laser could be really helpful as an adjunct to the care that we provide. But there is only one thing that no other healthcare professional can do that is in our tool belt and ours alone. And that is the spinal adjustment, right? Who who else can do this? You can fake it with a gross osteopathic mobilization move. You can fake it with joint mobilization. You could do a lot of things. But the bottom line is no one can do a chiropractic adjustment better than a doctor of chiropractic. In the sports world, as these pictures show you, you know, we have a really cool portable table that the team has had before I got there. So this thing is kind of old. But in the sports world, you've got to be able to adjust either on the ground or on high tables. You better learn a bunch of different techniques in your tool belt so that you can help these athletes. But getting into sports chiropractic and understanding what you say can either hurt or help you starts with developing relationships. For me, some of my best relationships are developed locally in the county for which I practice. And we have a great relationship, and I'm going to talk more about that. So let's talk about a couple things you could be doing to become more involved in the sports community in your office. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody remembers him, Commissioner Gordon, right? Batman. So who is the head of your local sports uh, teams uh, for your, your county teams, your local teams? There's usually a commissioner. And just Googling commissioner of whatever the name of your local sports team is, will find you a name, a phone number, a cell number, uh, an email address, if you want to get involved at that level. I decided to get involved at that level, and it has grown. I used to go out and teach a couple different things, uh, preventing dehydration and heat-related illness, um, proper stretching techniques, um, and more recently, I do a lot with concussion education and prevention. Now it's gotten to the point where I teach for the county in which I live, I teach the classes that every single volunteer coach, does not matter what the sport is, has to go through some sort of educational program that I instruct, as well as I get to handpick other instructors talking about other things. So developing a relationship like this is very, very, very important. So I like to start at the top. You don't have to. You can, if you know somebody who's a coach of a team or a parent of a kid, you can do that too. But you have to go in with a plan. You don't want to get to the commissioner and say, hey, uh, I can come in, um, uh, well, I can adjust everybody. Wouldn't that be cool? No. Please. I do it through education. I love to educate. And I, th I think most chiropractors do. It's kind of our role. So I have in my tool belt different things that I like to get out and teach. But when you're working in a, an environment where there are other health care providers, you have to know how to react there too, the doctor-to-doctor -doctor discussion. Um, if you are at the top of the chain, or you are at the bottom of the chain. There has to be some sort of chain of command at the different levels of which I work in the different colleges. That is very different too. And know your role. You know, are you there to just do chiropractic spinal manipulation at the director of an athletic trainer? Are you there 
because you are the head honcho and you're in charge and you're the one that's delegating. But make sure you know what your role is. Referral networks. A lot of times, I, I, I would bet right now, 75 to 80 percent of my new patients in our office are medical referrals. We have a great network of medical health care practitioners that we get to refer to and who refer to us. So for things that are outside my scope of practice, it makes the practitioner happy. It makes the patient happy that we didn't waste time treating something that we really should not be treating. So developing strong doctor-to-doctor -doctor relationships outside your practice is very important. <clears throat> Here's the biggest one. And this is where doctors of chiropractic kind of fall short a little bit. You need to develop great doctor athletic trainer relationships. So, so, so important because it is the athletic trainer that controls most of the sports world. And sometimes our profession discounts who they are and what they know and what they do because they don't have a doctor in front of their name. And this is so common that now in athletic, in the athletic training world, they're doing more to create a doctorate program. But they hold the strings. They are the ones that are treating these athletes all the time. And in most cases, the doctor of chiropractic is just a tool for them to help get the athlete better. The doctor and the coach. Uh, sometimes that could be a real, real, real interesting relationship, but you have to be proactive. you got to educate the coach. And then you also have to remember to be HIPAA compliant. If, you, if the athlete or the athlete's parental unit says, I do not want you talking to the coach, then you cannot talk to that coach. So you got to keep those, keep those things together. This is the biggest one. How tough is it to deal with parents? Parents can be very, very hard. But when you're treating, you have to make sure you have that consent to treat. You have to make sure the signatures are authentic. So I had a friend of mine uh, work with a local high school where he sent home permission slips. And half of those permission slips were not authentic signatures by the parents and I won't get into how he found out, but that can be a huge malpractice nightmare. Um, and you have to deal with, you know, emergency contacts. Uh, if you want to work with kids, I always recommend that you speak to all the parents as a group. And we do that with a couple of the local teams that we deal with. At the end of the day, they're the ones that are making the health care decisions for the kid anyway. So the doctor and the player, you and the athlete, you know, is a relationship that has to be kept professional, but it's established through communication and strong communication as well as education. Now, I can tell you in most of the environments that I work in, I do not make the call on return to play. It's required teamwork. If on a sideline, people will ask my opinion, but ultimately it is not my opinion. In most of the environments I work in, the final decision comes down to the head team physician and or the head athletic trainer. But you could see how this can really get crazy in different environments because communication is important. You know, if you're part of a big group and you have a chiropractor and then you have the athlete, one of the other players is the head athletic trainer, yeah, you may or may not have a team physician, you know, and then there's the coach. And in some cases, you know, the, the athlete may go to the head athletic trainer. Sometimes, you know, if trust is developed, he may go to the chiropractor, and the chiropractor has to report back to the head athletic trainer and has to go to the coach. And if you, if you see what I'm saying here, it's that whole communication thing. But the key to communication and covering your butt is, oh yeah, there's the parents too, but yeah. But the key to communication is documentation. 
no option. Back in the day, for some of you that have been practicing, and I can see a couple of you have gray hairs and have a hard time understanding what the Internet is, we never got permission slips. We never got consent to treat. We never got any of that, and we never documented things, especially on the field. But that's changed. So everything you do, you have to remember to be HIPAA compliant. You know, you can dictate, you can transcribe, and and I do um, any number of things with the different organizations that we work with. A lot of times it's handwritten. When we're on a sideline of an NFL game, on the back of our ID, we put white tape and everyone carries a Sharpie. I don't know why everybody in the NFL has a Sharpie handy, but and that's where you write down what you did. Uh, third quarter, three minutes, 25 seconds left, uh, so-and-so, I adjusted so-and-so, or I did this soft tissue. It's got to be documented. No matter where you are, that paperwork has to be done. Electronic medical records, uh, one of the colleges that we work with, we cannot leave the premises until all the notes are done of that day. And you may see between 10 and 20 kids in a couple hours, those notes have got to be done, got to be done right. And sometimes it's not up to you as to how you do it. We have we work with three different colleges, and each college is different as to how they want us to document. So you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared physically to treat, and you need to be prepared mentally to treat because what you say can hurt you. Here's a great example. I don't know, remember I talked about how I love the Wizard of Oz? Remember when Dorothy said, you know, how can you talk if you haven't got a brain? And the Scarecrow said, oh, I don't know, but some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? That's kind of, That kind of goes on in our office, too. <laughs> no, we kind of try to keep that out. But, right? I mean, how many times have you heard people say something that, like, what are you thinking? So I will tell you, that everything you're about to hear, these are not made up. These are not, oh, let's try. They, these are legit real things that I've been able to learn um, from athletic trainers and team physicians of things that people say that can hurt them. But I will tell you this, no matter what organization you work with, this is your number one rule. Leave your ego at the door. Number one, you know, people ask, well, how did you get involved with this team? How do you stay? This is number one, leave your ego at the door. Understand you are a tool working for a team if that's the case. If you are in your office, you don't have to leave your ego at the door. It's your office. You're the king. If it's your team and you are directly responsible for the health of each one of those athletes, don't leave your ego at the door because it's all on you. But if you're working in an outside organization, understand there are people being paid or are volunteering to handle the health care of those athletes. And you're just, you just popping in and out once a week or twice a week does not give you the background knowledge and access to the medical things that may or may not have been done for that athlete. You don't know. So you have to trust the people around you. And leave your ego at the door. I cannot emphasize that enough. So let's go through a couple things and uh, see if we can identify um, some of the things that you can do to maintain a job. So the first one is you never want to say, well, why did they do that to you? Meaning that if you're in a training room or you're in a group environment working with other doctors and an athlete comes up and this other provider did this within the organization, did some funky technique or had him do a certain exercise and you kind of like cringe because you saw him doing it, like you cannot say to that athlete, well, why'd they do that to you? It, it, you do not want to create any distrust but if it is a burning question for you, always feel free to ask the provider that did the work, hey, I saw you doing this really funky technique. What's that all about? I'm just trying to learn. 
you cannot question other health care providers within a health care system in front of a patient, but always feel free to discuss. This is one of my favorite ones. So a team doctor, uh, a, a team doctor of chiropractic uh, gets a job and he's working on an athlete and as he's working on the athlete, he's going through his normal exam and he's doing manual muscle testing. And as he's going through, the guy comes in, his neck's a little tight, and it's pre-season. And he's going through, and he takes him through a little cervical exam, and then he starts doing manual muscle testing. He said, well, this feels good, this feels good, this shoulder's weak, this one's okay. You know, trying to isolate down what nerve roots are coming from, where's the problem coming from, and I get that. The athlete hears the word weakness. So... The, the chiropractor adjusts them, does some soft tissue stuff, and sends the athlete on their way, and everything is great. The athlete leaves the doctor of chiropractic's office and calls his agent. And he says, agent, I, um, I went to one of the team doctors here, and he says I have weakness in my shoulder that I didn't have before. I just had a little neck stiffness. So the agent calls the head coach and says, hey, one of your doctors said my guy has shoulder weakness, so we want an injury settlement. For those not familiar in the NFL, an injury settlement means money against the salary cap, meaning that now that team can't spend money on talent because they have to pay this athlete with an alleged weakness, and it was all because of something that the doctor mumbled under their breath. So if you don't think as a doctor of chiropractic you can have a negative impact on a team, you absolutely can. You need to be careful of what you say. Saying to an athlete, you know, that comes into you and you're working as part of a healthcare organization, and, you know, you say to the athlete, ooh, I don't know, maybe you should get another opinion. Uh, Not the best thing to say. That's something you can go back to the head athletic trainer, to the head team physician, and say, look, I just saw so-and-so, and I think the condition is this. Maybe they should see this type of doctor. That's a conversation that you have with your teammates, not with the athlete. Another big problem. When you're working in a medical system, it's a system for a reason. There are a lot of different practitioners that do different things. You cannot refer somebody that has an ache or a pain or something totally different, like perhaps a uh, skin blemish and your buddy is the best dermatologist in town. That all has to be handled through the team. You can make a recommendation to the head athletic trainer and document that, hey, I noticed that uh, Joe Smith had uh, a mole that he probably should be evaluated. You can mention that to the athletic trainer, document it, and then you move on. You cannot refer. Here's another one. So you're taking somebody through an exam, you're working with this athlete, and then all of a sudden you say, Wow, have you gotten an MRI for that? You can't say that. If you don't want to treat the athlete because you suspect some sort of instability or tear, then don't. Just let the athlete know, I'm not going to be treating you today. I want to go over my findings with the uh, head team physician or the head team doctor and talk about it as a team. Don't create suspicion in the mind of an athlete when everything can be dealt with in house. Here's a big one that actually got someone in trouble uh, in a team last year, and it had to do with, you know, saying to the athlete, well, why weren't you getting adjusted before? I love training camp time of year because so many of these athletes, new athletes coming out of colleges and high schools have been treated by you guys, and, and they come demanding chiropractic. But there's still some that have not. And to create doubt in their mind, like, well, why why didn't my athletic trainer refer me before? Or 
you can't say that. You can be happy on the positive side that, hey, now this guy's getting treated. Definitely got to communicate those things. This is one that came up recently. Uh, I just want to get adjusted. Okay? No. You have to have a reason to adjust. You have to have a why and what for to adjust. And it may be that reason could be performance enhancement. It could be because there is an issue with subsequent complaints. But there always has to be some sort of justified reason. And I put this slide in here. Many of you may know who that is. But I put this slide in here for another reason because I had a new one come up yesterday. I was at our training camp and one of the athletes said, yeah, go ahead and adjust me. But you and I both know that all adjustments are not the same. We are all very, very different. So we have to use different techniques to do what we do best. Leaving your ego at the door, I like to find out what worked for that athlete before. But don't assume that, okay, it's been adjusted before, I could just go ahead and adjust, because you don't know what kind of funky techniques our brethren are practicing out there. I still go through and explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So let's talk about the training room. You know, I don't know how many of you have been in a training room before, but every training room is different. And it is so important to learn your way around because it can definitely be a maze. When I go into a new training room, I learned how to work every machine. I know where the different things are in case I need them instead of struggling to look for them. I do whatever it takes to learn that training room and learn what's on the inside. When you're working in the sports medicine sports chiropractic world, you always have to have your ears open. You want to know what are the players saying about you. A lot of it's going to have to do with what you say to them. What are the staff saying about you? What about the other trainers? So always have your ears open. You also have to have your ears open for changes. Times change. Practice times change. Locations change change. So you always, always, always have to have your ears open. You need to know what your responsibilities are. For me, I, I, you know, it's not my responsibility, but when towels come out of laundry, I'll fold them. I'll stack them. I'll clean tables. My responsibilities are, don't include any of that. My responsibilities primarily is on the scope of practice as a doctor of chiropractic, but as a team player, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that person better. And it's really interesting because we have such a big tool belt, a lot of people think all we do is just adjust. But you need to make clear in the right way, well, these are the other things that I do. I can also do dry needling. I can also do soft tissue techniques. I also do instrument-assisted techniques. But you have to find the right time and place to explain those things. You just can't knock down a door and say, hey, look at me. This is what I do. So finding the right time and the right place to talk about what your strengths are are real important. And you talk about them not just with the head athletic trainer, but with all the athletic trainers. For example... If you do dry needling, you just can't say that to a player. Hey, you know what? Maybe we should do some of that dry needling stuff. If that team already has someone that's doing it, you may be a backup, but you have to, again, go through the head athletic trainer. And, again, every single training room is different. I put this slide up because this is uh, Ryan Vermillion. He is the head athletic trainer with your Carolina Panthers and a great guy. Um, I had an opportunity to work with him down in Carolina oh, many years ago, um, about 15 years ago, and their training room was very, very different than ours. You know, you have to know how are players being referred to you, or is it an open access? Um, and then, you know, are you just treating players, 
or are you treating staff too? I can tell you that I spend almost as much time on treating staff as I do players. And when you treat staff, you need to do it in the same way that you treat the players. You need to document, document, you need to document all of the work that you do, whether you're doing it with a player or uh, a staff member. And I will, I will say this over and over again. It, it, you could be a professional athlete making gajillions of dollars and, and, you know, they say to you, hey, man, can you just get me adjusted real quick on the side here? You know, let, let's just go ahead and do this. And you do, and you don't document, and something goes wrong. That millionaire athlete will be right at your door with their hand out. So will that staff person. So document everything, everything, everything that you do. Here's where we have a problem. We are horrible at speaking the same language in the sports world. Like we have a language in our office that you, that you, may, you have slang terms for. We have a language in chiropractic like, that cannot be used in the public uh, sports medicine world. You can't say to a head athletic trainer, hey, this guy's got a PI ileum. You can't say to um, a head team physician, well, Atlas is lateral to ag. No. We need to break it down into terms that we all understand, like segmental dysfunction and, and spasm and radiculopathy. And you know, listings may mean something to us, and at a private time, show it, or you can document it just to keep things right in your notes. But we need to talk the same language that many of these head athletic trainers and many of these healthcare professionals do. So being prepared for all of this starts with you. You've got to be in the right mindset to work in sports. Do you, you know what? You could be the king of your office, and that's great. You're doing a great service for the public. You're doing a great service to your patients. You're earning a nice income. Perfect. But you can't do that in the sports medicine world. And, and understand, it's just like if a, an athletic trainer or a physician walked into your office and said, ooh, why are you doing that neck like that? That wouldn't be cool because you don't want to be doing the same thing in their world as well. So with that being said, Christy, I don't know if we have time, and I think we do. We do have time for questions. I would love to answer them. And, and before I do, um, I, I just want to personally thank you, Christy, and want to thank Cairo Health USA um, for everything that they do for our profession. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm allowed to be saying this now, but you have the control, so you can cut me off if you want. But we used another... Uh, provider in our office for years, and they never did anything for our profession. I, I can tell you that Cairo Health USA spends gobs and gobs with a lot of zeros of money back into the profession, and not just through education, but helping to fund a lot of things that, that moves our profession forward. So thank you for doing what you do. And, and for our office, it was the easiest thing to implement. Um, being a, a sports chiropractor and kind of a in a high-profile office because of all the people that we treat and all the um, groups that we work with, it is very important for our I's to be dotted and T's crossed. And utilizing Chiro Health USA has made that very, very easy, especially for me. I'm in an area where there's a lot of military that don't have chiropractic benefits. Um, a lot of these plans now have outrageously high deductibles, and it's made it so much easier for those people to get the care that they need. Um, it, it's been great, a great relationship. So thank you, Christy. I, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent, but if we're allowed to answer questions, I would love to do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Sokoloff. And yes, we do have a couple of questions 
Um, the first one is, what company did you use to earn your dry needling certification? Wow. Um, th that That is a great question. And I got yelled at. <laughs> I was in an airport, and I got yelled at by a doctor of chiropractic who yelled at me for being a traitor to our profession because I got my dry needling done through... Uh, a company called Structure and Function, which it was provided by Sue Falsoni, who's a physical therapist and athletic trainer. Um, it was very important for me to learn from her because she was the head athletic trainer with the Los Angeles uh, Dodgers for six years. She's worked all kinds of athletic events. So it was important for me to learn what was going on you know, in their world, because that's the world that I chose to live and work in. I had others that had taken this other doctor's class, which was a great class, so we were able to share information instead of just being stubborn and, and, and looking down a funnel of how to do things. I love to learn from everybody, but so Sue, Sue Falsoni, Structure and Function, tell her I said, hey, she's a great, wacky lady that has so much knowledge. This is a great question. How does a chiropractic sports provider manage to get into educating the local population when in my area there is a huge orthopedic firm that has cornered the market uh, for high school and, co and college? Okay, great question. And you know what? You, you don't want that high school nonsense. You, you don't want it at all. College is different. College is cool. Hi, I am uh, a fan of not getting involved too much with high schools. Number one, it's very hard to do. Number two, they practice when I'm at my busiest time, you know, treating patients. So how am I going to be there? What do I need to do? I'll develop relationships and I get a lot of referrals from local high schools. But the number, number one market to go after are the rec kids, the recreational leagues. There is nobody looking out for them. So if you can go in and offer your services to teach or look, if you're going to offer your services to teach what a subluxation is or you want to adjust the world, the door will be closed. But if you want to go in and provide a service as to, hey, this is who I am and this is what I do, then you will have great accessibility at a local level in educating coaches educating parents and they're the ones that ultimately make the health care decisions for the kids so for example when i you know if a rec league says hey will you sponsor my team i said sure i'd love to sponsor your team and they're like okay that'll be two hundred dollars i said great here's a check but this is what i want in return number one i want to meet with all the parents number two i want to meet with the coaches and the kids because if you guys are not practicing good health things, I'm not sponsoring you. I'm not putting my name on your jersey just so you can get some cash unless you're practicing good, healthy things. I, I don't want you drinking diet soda on a bench when you should be having water or whatever. So, um, yes, I, I'm, and the college thing, there's great, great, great opportunity for chiropractic care at a college level. I just helped two guys get uh, gigs at colleges, it, and that's a whole nother webinar that we could do. Awesome, and I am so passionate about rec league sports and how important it is to educate parents and coaches. This is like one of those things that I think instantly drew me to you, Dr. Sokoloff, because of how passionate you are about really helping kids early, helping these Great. athletes early. I, I can't tell you how cool it is when when I, I and especially, um, you, you know, at the beginning of football season, you know, the, these guys are coming from different colleges that maybe didn't have a chiropractor, and they but they saw their chiropractor in their hometown of Nowheresville, whatever, and, and they already have con some sort of base knowledge that, you know, I, I, I know I need to get adjusted to perform at my best especially at the level that they have to perform. 
Oh, absolutely. It's so funny because I know that you and I talked about this uh, earlier this year. So my 12-year-old plays competitive. He's competitive taekwondo. Um, and, you know, we pulled him out of baseball because I had issues with their scheduling and how much they were working. But he transitioned to taekwondo. And he will tell everyone, anyone who listens, at, you know, people on his team, his um, coaches, assistant coaches, parents, that, that he's only able to do what he does and practice with them five days a week because of chiropractic. Um, and his, like, he has the least amount of energies, the quickest rebound after a competition. It's just amazing. But anyway, I digress because I'm just passionate about youth sports but in rec leagues. Um, being a female doc and former Division One athlete, do you see a change coming anytime soon for female physicians being associated with pro teams? Um, I, I think that time is now and has been recently. Um, the head of the NFL team physicians is uh, Dr. Leanne Curl, and she I have worked with her at the Baltimore Ravens for the last 20 years, and uh, also with the University of Maryland. Um, so a, a female in that role in the medical world is there. Uh, there is a female doctor of chiropractic with the Detroit Lions. There are female doctors of chiropractic involved in professional basketball and ice hockey. So it, it it may have been a thing of the past where it was tough to um, to even see one person involved, but now there are multiple people involved um, as doctors of chiropractic with professional teams. But you have to start somewhere. You've got to start. You plant a seed and working with. You know, you've got to be able to work in that environment before you can start working with the big boys. In most cases, I, there there are stories where one of one of my my favorite stories is the guy who's the chiropractor for uh, the Oakland Raiders uh, was a contractor, you know, while he was waiting for his license and made a bet with the head athletic trainer whose house he was building. Said, "Hey, if you finish the house on time, you got the job." Um, now, granted, the the doctor is very skilled and and he's great. He's actually teaching now. But there, there are a lot of different doctors of chiropractic at, with professional teams of all uh, genders that um, that have gotten there through different ways. That is awesome. Uh, let me see if you have any more questions. Now's the time to submit them. Um, I do again just want to remind you for anybody who's going to be attending the FCA National. Um, that is coming up August 16th through the 19th. Um, Dr. Sokoloff is going to be speaking. Um, you know, he's going to, um, he's one of the many speakers that we're sponsoring. Dr. Jay Greenstein, who he mentioned, will also be speaking um, at that event. It is incredible. If you've never been to that event, you are missing out. It is like the largest chiropractic convention in the country. Just absolutely amazing. And again, he is an amazing presenter on a webinar, but Dr. Sokoloff is just absolutely incredible. Uh, live and in person, he also gets a whole lot more time um, at a live seminar or convention than he does on my webinar series. So please, if you have an opportunity to see him uh, in a city near you, please go, and uh, you will not regret it in the slightest. Um, let's see, no more questions. So just want to remind you that next week we have Dr. Steve Conway, uh, doctor of chiropractic and healthcare attorney, uh, and his good friend, Dr. Scott Munsterman, who are going to be here to answer 99% of your Medicare questions. If, you, if there's any confusion in your mind um, in any aspect of Medicare, I encourage you to register now. Um, because we are very quickly getting to where we're maxing out on our available seats 
for that presentation. It will be recorded. A link to the recording is sent to everyone who registered. So even if you don't think you have time to attend, go ahead and register. It guarantees you're going to get emailed that reminder email that the webinar recording is available. And then next week, we have Dr. Fabrizio Mancini, who is going to uh, be building us up for the fall, talking about how to have a fab life in practice. Um, you know, I think every couple of times a year we need that kind of motivation and inspiration. Um, and he's honestly can sound like the happiest person I've ever met in my life. Um, and you can't help but smile when you are sitting in one of his classes, talking to him on the phone, uh, hearing one of his webinars. It's exactly what you need uh, to really recharge your batteries, fall in love with chiropractic all over again. Um, so check those out. We've got a webinar series posted through September. We're going to be filling out the rest of the year. You'll see October, November, and December popping up. Uh, be on the lookout. Dr. Sokoloff will be back um, in 2019 because we're full for the rest of the year. But be on the lookout. Um, and again, go and see him live and in person if you have the opportunity. Um, we'll be sponsoring him all over the country. He has an incredible message, very passionate about the work that he does. Um, so it's in, we're just, you know, excited about working with him um, in the next year. So great news, everybody. We're going to end four minutes early, which means you have time to take a deep breath, run to the restroom, get that last bite of luncheon before you go out there um, and change the lives of the patients who are waiting to see you today. Uh, so go make some miracles happen, and I look forward to seeing you next week, same time, same place. Y'all have an amazing rest of your day. Dr. Sock?